Praise the Lord. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to all our online students and our in-person students. Thank you for joining us. Also, welcome to our uh, e-learning students who will be listening to these lectures um, later on. Um, we'll continue studying the book of Acts. Yes, and uh, we are looking at uh, the publication. We're looking at the publication, revivals, visitation, and the moves of God. And uh, we're studying the revival that started on the day of Pentecost and how it um, moved through Jerusalem and to the surrounding cities and the nations. And we also see how one person can birth a revival. So we are studying the life of? Whose life are we studying? Apostle Paul, yes. And we looked at his first missionary journey in the second missionary journey. We came almost to the end of the second missionary journey. So we look at a few um, highlights of the second missionary journey, and then we'll continue uh, to the third missionary journey. OK. Uh, before we begin, can one of you please lead us in prayer, please? Anyone can unmute your mics and lead us in prayer. Thank you, God. We surrender this day in your hands and we surrender everything, Lord Jesus. Lord, help us to learn and help us to grow in your word, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Make us a, uh, a revival, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Viman. So we came to the end of Paul's third missionary journey. And what was the main highlight in his, uh, uh, sorry, we came to the end of Paul's second missionary journey. What is the main highlight in the second missionary journey? He, sorry, can you use the mic, please? So all of them can hear. Yes. He went to the place where people are gathering and he preached there. Okay. What is the main highlight of uh, Paul's second missionary journey? main highlight compared to his first missionary journey what's the main highlight sorry that he did even in the first missionary journey right he preached to the gentiles what's the main highlight it's not given in your book you'll have to think if you listen to the lecture last week online students what's the main highlight uh, please take the mic Diksha, uh, online in-person students, if you want to answer, please take the mic and speak so that our online students and our e-learning students will also be able to hear. Others will just be a blank there. Yeah. Okay. Holy Spirit was leading him, but still he was using the wisdom that God has given him. Okay. Very good. Though uh, we saw in the beginning of the second missionary journey, we saw that. Um, they had plans to go to different places, but the Holy Spirit led them to different cities, very strategic cities that he led them to. What are some of the main strategic important cities that the Holy Spirit led them to? Athens. Philippi, yes, in Macedonia. Okay, what else? Athens, Macedonia, that's Philippi. What's another major city? Lystra. Okay, Lystra is in. Uh, uh, is a, it's something that he went in the first missionary journey. Greece. Uh, Corinth, Berea. Corinth, yes, Corinth and Berea. Right? Yes, thank you. So he went to all of these very important strategic cities, and it was he was led by the Holy. Spirit, and we see how, in spite of them having their own plans, they were open to what the Holy Spirit was leading them, and how powerfully the Holy Spirit led them to these um, some of these major um, cities through which you know the gospel can also be reached out to other neighboring um, towns and other neighboring um, cities. Okay, um, so we see that you know. Um, uh, Paul spends about three years in the second missionary journey, okay, and he's traveled almost 1,900 miles. 
um uh, you know uh, you know he's 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 uh, traveled 2500 miles compared to the first missionary journey which was only 1100 miles and um, we see that in the second missionary journey he had gone to more places than he did in the first missionary journey okay uh, we look at a few highlights of his journey we see that he went to some major cities like Athens and Corinth and also Philippi okay these were prominent cities in the Roman province of Achaia and we know Athens was known for what the city of Athens was known for Philosoph philosophers, yes, intellectuals, uh, mostly people in the marketplace, in the Aeropagus, uh, in the Agora, they were also just, you know, Agora, they were just discussing and discussing and, you know, very intellectual uh, people. And we see that in the, in the city of Corinth, Corinth was known for what was famous in the city of Corinth. Hello? Please read your notes and come, otherwise you are going to totally look blank. What is uh, Corinth known for? Very important, right? It's a very commercial city, yes, it was a seaport and so there was a lot of trade that was happening. There was a lot of economic prosperity. Also, there was a lot of idolatry idol worship that was um, there and also people were very immoral okay in the city of Corinth and people were pursuing pleasure okay just enjoying life so you know these are two uh, significant cities even the, in the city of Macedonia that uh, 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 you know the Holy Spirit takes him and we see that despite the challenges okay they, there were many challenges that these cities uh, posted Okay, Berians also were known for, uh, he went to even Thessalonica, right? Beria, Thessalonica. Thessalonians and Berians were somebody who were also intellectual. They were looking at scripture, reasoning, trying to understand. So we see that uh, Paul effectively communicated the gospel of the message of Jesus Christ in these various different cities with different needs. So when God takes us to different cities, there are different needs in different cities. Okay, in Athens, there's not much of immorality compared to Corinth and in Beria and in Thessalonica. And, um, you know, but uh, uh, in Athens, it was more of a philosophical, intellectual mindset. And so we see that, you know, Paul, uh, even though there were different mindsets, there were different needs, Paul is ministering to them okay so do you think paul was very confident in ministering to these people what do you think what do you think paul was very uh, confident in ministering to them with the intellectuals the philosophers with these people in Athen, in corinth with their immorality what do you think do we have some answers please everyone here in class today looks like uh, everyone is in sleep mode yes tell me do you think he went with great uh, confidence with you know because he knew the scriptures he can reason well what do you think uh, sister he was uh, confident because of the wisdom of the holy spirit okay he depended totally on the wisdom of the holy spirit Okay, so his confidence came from the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Sister Gertrude. Anyone else? Look at what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Can somebody read that, please? 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Okay, just like to uh, make a note here, we hardly do two or three pages, okay, of this textbook in two hours. And I'm sure you can at least have half an hour to just read these two or three pages and come to class, okay? So next week, please, at least I expect the in-person students to do that because you have study time, right? Yeah, but most of you are totally looking blank. So please take some time. We hardly cover two or three pages, which is nothing much. It will just take you half an hour to read. Read. These are very important things, okay, because 
we are living the end times and in the end times god is accelerating things if you heard what pastor spoke in his sermon on sunday if we are in the end times doesn't mean that we are just waiting for the coming of the lord so that we can be raptured and you know not be there during tribulation no it's a time when he is accelerating things he's speeding up things and he's looking up to you and me right so you are you are here in bible college to study um to uh, prepare yourself so i think it's important because most of you are coming blank to every class that means you're not reading your notes you're not studying which makes no sense because you're in bible college right i can understand the in person students uh, i mean sorry the online students they are also working but in person students you're here full time and you have time to study so please read because all of you are just totally coming blank which is not a good thing and we are here to um prepare and so please spend time to read okay at least two or three pages and come to class okay so can somebody please read first corinthians chapter 2 verses 3 to 4 please i was with you in weakness in fear and in much trembling and my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom but in demonstration of the spirit and of power amen so here what is paul telling the church at corinth when he came to them he came in much weakness in fear and much trembling okay because but he, he says he preached the word not with persuasive words of human wisdom but like sigetrud was saying to the demonstration of the spirit and of power okay so we'll see how in spite of the different challenges that these cities that he went to in the second missionary journey in spite of all of that we we'll see paul's approach what did he do we can learn from his approach okay despite the challenges we see that paul ministered in the power and the wisdom of the holy spirit okay and he was able to effectively communicate the message of Jesus Christ and that is how he established communities uh, with christian believers in all of these cities so we see that even though there were real challenges that he faced in evangelism he says that you know um, what is the main cause of it look at what he says in second corinthians chapter 4 verse 4 he says in second corinthians chapter 4 verse 4 that the god of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers okay so paul knows his strategy for missions or evangelism or preaching or teaching and something that you and i can learn as well that you know when we are going to preach and teach people they are blinded by the god of this world that is satan because satan has blinded the minds of unbelievers which means paul knew that when he takes a word to them he has to it's a spiritual warfare right are you listening yes it's a spiritual warfare we don't do it in our own strength in our own capabilities but we uh, it's a spiritual warfare that we have and so he was mindful of uh, that we also see that paul you know irrespective of what the community was whether it was idolatry immorality whether it they were philosophical intellectuals we see he does not spend time in meaningless and useless arguments or you know uh, he was not distracted by any of their arguments or their um, philosophical ideas but we see that every time he went and he preached and he ministered to people you know he focused on the work of the cross and that is what we read in first corinthians chapter 1 verses 20 to 24 this is all what the places that he had gone through the church he had gone to in uh, corinth you know and ministered to their see, see what he writes in first corinthians chapter 1 verses 20 to 24 can somebody read that please First Corinthians chapter one verses twenty to twenty-four. This man, where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know Him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand miraculous signs, and Greeks. look for wisdom but we preach christ crucified a stumbling block to jews and foolishness to gentiles 
but to those whom god has called both jews and greeks christ the power of god and the wisdom of god amen so what is paul saying here you know even if there's intellectuals philosophers you know wise people foolish people how does he minister to them what does he preach to them he preaches to them the yeah christ crucified he preaches to them the work of christ that he has done on the cross so this is something that we also can learn that when we are put in front of people who are intellectual smart you know or uh, wise in the ways of this world or you know uh, people on big uh, levels of uh, authority whether it's government or you know ceos of company or even people who are simple foolish uh, filled with you know idolatry with an uh, idol idolatry uh, idol mindset we can always st stick to one thing preach the full message or the complete message of the work of the cross okay that is what paul was preaching and he was not getting into any of these arguments with people and we also read first corinthians chapter 2 verses 3 to 4 where he says he did not come in persuasive words of human wisdom but with a demonstration of the spirit and the power so he says he comes with the power of the holy spirit and so also when we minister to people you know any um, uh, strata of society any level of society we can preach to them with confidence with the power of the holy spirit okay and even when he's writing to timothy he says you know uh, uh, timothy don't engage in few you know in disputes and um, in in futile arguments and discussions because all of them end in disputes and strife and division because it is meaningless he tells her he tells timothy it's meaningless to engage in disputes and um, arguments why because it's the it's the uh, power of this world the god of this world that has blinded these eyes of the people so you can't discuss with them all you can do is just speak the truth and he knows that the truth will set them free so it's the truth the power of god's word and the power of the holy spirit that makes the word manifest makes the word a reality and truth okay so that is what we can also learn even as we live in a world where it was is similar to corinth today's world is so much of immorality idolatry there's trade happening and also in uh, cities where people are very intellectual but we can see that we don't have to fear to preach the gospel because of what paul did and we see the mighty move of god and how god moved in the cities of athen and corinth and berea and thessalonica okay so we too can minister and you know pray and ask god to accelerate things in our lives you know like the early church they not only preached the word but their word was attested with signs miracles and wonders okay so that is what he says he paul says i minister to the power of the holy spirit that means preaching and through signs wonders and miracles okay and don't avoid please avoid arguments sometimes we get into arguments with people when we are sharing the gospel it makes no use and makes no it is no of no help okay so we see that uh, towards the end of that uh, second missionary journey paul comes back to his home church where is his home church where is his home church antioch in syria okay so he comes back to his own church home church from where he started out his first and second missionary journey and he comes back after his first and second missionary journey and when he was in antioch there was an incident that happened now peter had come apostle peter had come all the way from jerusalem he had come to antioch and you know he was nicely uh, min, uh, speaking fellowshipping eating with the gentiles but when some jews from the church in jerusalem they traveled all the way to antioch and they come there you know suddenly peter changed peter refused to fellowship with the gentiles he's refused to uh, he stopped eating with the gentiles so when uh, paul noticed this change in behavior of apostle peter he was very very upset and we see that he confronts him okay he confronts him and he tells him even though uh, you know uh, peter was a senior apostle we see that paul was not afraid to 
correct him. Why was Paul not afraid to correct him? Because it was it was something that had to do with, you know, the truth of the gospel. The truth of the gospel is what? Righteousness is by grace through faith. Okay. And that is what God had established. That is what the, the truth of the gospel is. And righteousness is not through keeping the laws or it is not through the physical outward sign of the covenant that is circumcision, but it is righteousness through grace by, uh, so, sorry, by um, uh, grace through faith. Okay. So this was totally contradicting what Peter was doing. And Peter was a senior apostle. And if he's behaving like this and he's contradicting the truth, then it will also lead to other Jewish believers to follow what Peter is doing. So we see that, you know, uh, uh, Paul isn't afraid to correct him. And even as he corrects him, we see that, you know, Paul does not do it out of disrespect. He has great respect for Peter. Uh, Peter, that does not change, but we see that he corrects him. So there is something that we learn in uh, in revivals, moves of God, visitation, even in our context that we are living in, you know, where we are seeing God's small revivals that are being birthed. They can be people who are in um, uh, positions of leadership, who can do things that are against the uh, or contrary to the word of God or to the doctrines or to the to the uh, to the beliefs that we believe in and so we need to take that stand to speak to them but like Paul writes in Ephesians speaking the truth in love yes speak the truth in love okay we need to speak the truth in love and we need to correct people otherwise this can become a major error and something that can you know become a wrong doctrine that people can address okay so that was all about paul's second missionary journey now we'll move to paul's sec third missionary journey okay um, and that starts from uh, the book of acts acts chapter 18 verse 23 onwards okay now um, in Paul's third missionary journey, something very interesting is he does not go to any of the any new places. Okay, like the first and second missionary journey, he went to he was led to go to many new places. But in his third missionary journey, he does not go to any of the new places, but he goes back to the same places that he had visited in his first. And in the second journey, and what does he do when he goes there? He goes there to establish or he goes there to strengthen the leaders and strengthen the work that is happening in the churches. Okay. So that is something that we can also learn that, you know, if God calls you to be an apostle, an evangelist, a missionary, you birth something in some place, you know, it's important that you go back, keep strengthening the churches, write letters to them like Paul did, also go and minister to them. And we'll see how Paul strengthened these churches, uh, which will give us an idea of how we as pastors, some of you are called to be pastors, missionary, missionaries, apostles, evangelists, how and what you can do to strengthen strengthen the churches okay so his last missionary journey the third one lasted for about four years okay and uh, most of the time in uh, his third missionary journey uh, where does he spend anyone knows where he spends most of the time Ephesus yes okay he spends most of his time in um, Ephesus okay um, um, and um, we see that, you know, he spends three years over there and a great work is established at um, Ephesus. Okay. So if you put up the map of the third missionary journey, okay, we'll see that Paul starts from his home church again, Antioch, like he started his first, second, also the third missionary journey. Okay. And then he goes on to the regions of Galatia, uh, which he's gone in the first and second missionary journey as well. That is Derby. Lystra and Iconium. And then he goes to Pisidia, which is Antioch of Pisidia. Okay. So the map is there on your um, on your screen. So you see that he goes all the way from Antioch. He travels up to, um, you know, a Derby. And then he goes to Lystra. And if you see that, you know, the, uh, the red line that's following there, he's, you see, he comes to Antioch. Okay, and then from Antioch, he goes all the way to Pergiria. 
Okay, so you can see that whole place there is Fergidia. He goes there. And what is he doing? He's strengthening the disciples and the churches. And then from Fergidia, he comes all the way to um, Ephesus. Okay. Can you see Ephesus in the map? I can't see. <laughs> okay, so uh, Ephesus is there, and then he spends about three years of the four years in this missionary journey at Ephesus. Okay, now it's important to uh, when he goes into Ephesus, uh, we see that you know Apollos. You know Apollos. Who is Apollos? We looked, studied Apollos in the second missionary journey. Who is Apollos? Apollos is a believer, right? And then he comes to Corinth where he meets whom? He meets Priscilla and Aquila and Priscilla, the couple there. And he knows only about John's baptism. And they preach and they teach him about Jesus Christ, um, the person and work of Jesus Christ and everything. And he's baptized. And then he goes off to Ephesus. So when he comes, Paul comes to Ephesus, you know, Apollos is already there. He's already ministered there. Okay. Yeah, that was the second missionary journey. This is the third one. Yeah. Can you uh, make it a little bigger? Yeah. Okay. Here we are. This is, that, sorry, the other one was the second missionary journey. This is the third missionary journey. Okay. So we see when he comes to um, uh, Ephesus that Apollos was there ministering, but Apollos, no, the, yeah, that is the one, yes. Yeah, this is the right one. You can enlarge it, please. So we see that when he comes here to Ephesus that, you know, um, um, uh, Apollos has already ministered and then he's gone off to Corinth. But uh, we see that, you know, their people were not baptized in the Holy Spirit. So when uh, when... Paul comes to Ephesus, he first ministers to these people, uh, he baptizes them in the Holy Spirit, and we see that they start speaking in tongues, okay? So in the in the, the book of Acts, we see seven incidents where there's a baptism of the Holy Spirit. Five out of that seven, we see, you know, people started speaking in tongues, okay? So that is why we say that when, you know, when you baptize the Holy Spirit, the first thing you'll do is speak in tongues, but here also they prophesy. So about 12 people were ministered to. So the start of his work at Ephesus, there were 12 people. So we'll read on from uh, Acts chapter 19, verses 8 to 22. And like we are doing, we just let the word of God minister to us. So I'm not going to uh, look at the details of what, you know, went through in the, in the, uh, in the third missionary journey, we're just going to read the book of Acts. And even as somebody's reading, I want all of you to please open your Bibles, follow through so that you know uh, what Paul has done in his uh, third missionary journey. And I'm not going to mention it uh, again, just highlight a few things, but we will just read and let the word of God speak to us. Okay. So can somebody please clearly and nicely read Acts chapter 19 verses 8 to 22, please. Chapter 19 verses 8 onwards. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left them. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon possessed. They would say, in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. One day, the evil spirit answered them, Jesus, I know, and I know Paul, but who are you? Then 
the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all he gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding when this became known to the jews and greeks living in ephesus they were all seized with fear and the name of the lord jesus was held in high honor many of those who believed now came and openly confessed their evil deeds a number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly when they calculated the value of the scrolls the total came to 50000 drachmas drachmas in this way the word of the lord spread widely and grew in power after all this had happened paul decided to go to jerusalem passing through macedonia and achaia after i have been there he said i must visit rome also he sent two of his helpers timothy and erastus to macedonia while he stayed in the province of asia a little longer amen so we see that paul after he ministered to these 12 people where does he go and preaches the synagogues that was something customary that he used to do and then we see that you know the uh, the the jews they refused how many months he was preaching there in the synagogue three months they refused to believe and so he went to the uh, he took up the hall of tyrannus and he started to a small bible school there for how many years he taught there two years yes and we see that during this time in ephesus paul did some extraordinary miracles okay so there were some extraordinary unusual um, and powerful miracles that god did through uh, paul it's not that you know he did not do any miracles in his first and second missionary journey but he did but also we see in the third missionary journey we see, we are seeing greater signs miracles and uh, wonders were just continuing okay so the signs miracles and wonders were actually greater and increasing you know so this should be our expectation during revival so during revival even when you know time passes the many months or years that the revival has happened we can still expect a greater move of god amen we can greater move a greater signs and miracles an increase in a, and a, a greater signs and miracles than we have ever uh, seen before so that should be our expectation during um, revival and we see that you know the impact the seven sons of skiva had you know with that demon possessed man so we see that god works so powerfully that you know even as he was working with just the seven sons of skiva we see that it had such a profound impact such a great impact and how great or profound was the impact was that people all over ephesus heard about it and the whole you know um uh, witchcraft and sorcery the strongholds were broken imagine they 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 uh you they actually burnt all those scrolls in which they used to study witchcraft and sorcery that means what god was just taking it out of its root right so we can expect this to happen in revival when revival happens we can expect god to break strongholds from its root like whether it's adultery immorality pornography uh, you know whether alcoholic addiction whatever it is you no know, we can expect god to uproot it from its very root lay the axe to the root okay so this is what happened here in revival in um, ephesus that the power of god was so powerfully moving that the work of the enemy the strongholds were broken and the demonic powers that were they were at uh, working there was broken and you know um, paul was able to bring in many into the kingdom of uh, god okay so that is what we can also expect in revival and you can expect in revival that things that have ruined the very moral fiber of society things that are uh, coming against the kingdom of god can be uprooted and can be torn down from its very roots amen okay so we see that paul preached and then um you know he uh, taught in this tyrannus hall uh, for about 2 years and during this time he raised up many many 
leaders. Many young people, many people who went about all of the regions around uh, Ephesus. And, uh, you know, Paul was just teaching, but the people that he had trained, he had ministered, went all around Ephesus. Uh, that is the seven churches of Asia that we read in Revelation chapter 2 and Three. Okay, so Revelation 2 and 3, we read about the seven churches, Ephesus, Spirna, uh, Pergamos, Titeria, Sardis, uh, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. These seven uh, places, churches were established. And how were these churches established? You know, um, uh, commentary writers or scholars say that it was people who Paul taught in this, uh, this hall, lecture hall of Tyrannus, that they went out and they spread the gospel to the region surrounding um, Ephesus. So we see that Paul also raised up many young leaders. Uh, so this is something very characteristic of Paul, and it should also be very characteristic of us and people in mission, people uh, in revival, people who are birthing revival, that we don't think that revival ends with us. It's not we building our own kingdom, but we are building the kingdom of God and we need to extend the kingdom of God. So to extend the kingdom of God, we have to raise up leaders. Okay, the next generation, the next generation of leaders, whether it is youth, adults, youth, children, we need to raise them up so that they can carry on the work. And that is what we see that even after Paul went, they ha he was so confident to leave people like uh, uh, Aquila, Priscilla, um, you know, um, uh, 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 um, um, you know, Titus and um, Timothy and, uh, you know, so many uh, um, Philemon, Epaphras, uh, Onesimus, all of these people who he had raised and ministered to, so many of them, uh, you know, went on to be mighty leaders and bishops of the church later on after Paul. So the work continued, the work of revival continued, the revival fire even continued after Paul was was uh, was, uh, uh, was killed. Okay, so here we see that he trains many young leaders. Okay, um, to over uh, elders and overseers to shepherd the church at Ephesus because Paul knew that he's not going to be forever. Amen. In Ephesus, he has to move around, and he also knows he's going to die soon. So you know he's raising up many uh, people, elders and overseers to take over the church, and that is what we need to do we can't see ourselves as always being in authority and in leadership and sitting on the throne forever amen that's not possible okay we need to move on and we will move on and we will also move on from this earth to glory okay but we need to raise up many young people to carry on the work amen okay so we see that uh, during this time paul also met philemon and epaphras philemon and epaphras were from colossae and they established churches in colossae uh, philemon had a home church meeting and son epaphras you know they say that he was the one who established the church at um, uh, colossae okay um, and um, uh, paul ministered to them also at this time okay and we see that uh, paul planned to go from Ephesus to Macedonia, Achaia, and then on to Jerusalem, and then to um, Rome. Okay, uh, so what was his reason why he wanted to go to Jerusalem? It was because he wanted to, he collected money from all the saints and he wanted to give it to the people in Jerusalem because they were going through famine. And that's why we see that he sends Timothy and Erastus to Macedonia to get collection from them so that he can take it to the churches at um, Jerusalem. Okay. During this time, we also see that, you know, um, some people from Chol's household were living in Corinth. They come to Ephesus to meet Paul and they give him a first hand situation of what is happening at the church at Corinth. We know that this is Paul's third missionary journey. And in the second missionary journey, he ministered at Corinth. Okay. So there was a lot of problems that were happening at Corinth. So we see that they, they tell him and also other people came from the church at Corinth to Ephesus. They meet Paul. And so when he was in his second, third missionary journey, he writes first Corinthians and he might have sent it to one of these people who came from Corinth or he would have sent it 
to um, uh, uh, Titus, uh, who he uh, sent to Corinth to you know oversee the work there. So you see that how Paul raises up these young people like Titus and Timothy, mentors them, and then he gives you know once they come to that place of you know where they're mature enough, he gives them important leadership positions and he trust them with it and also he keeps strengthening them and encouraging them to let us so we see that he sends um, the letter to Corinth the first Corinthians uh, to um, Titus just um, to correct all of the problems and the difficulties that he had heard about there and we see finally that uh, Demetrius a silversmith okay who makes shines of this goddess Dinah Ephesus was known for the goddess uh, Diana, okay, they say that her idol fell from heaven. It was her temple was one of the seven wonders of the world at that time. It was fully made with marble. The streets, the sun was uh, paved with marble. And also, uh, there was a lot of temple prostitution that was happening in that place. And um, these silversmiths were making these, um, uh, you know, sh these uh, idols of uh, goddess Diana, you know, they started an uproar. Why did they start an uproar? Because many of them were becoming believers and now these silversmiths were running out of business. So they wanted Paul to leave that city so that he does not continue the work and their, uh, does, their business doesn't go on a loss. And also maybe they were concerned about maybe their goddess Diana that they're worshipping their religious goddess, you know, that she was uh, not becoming very prominent. And so there was a big uproar. And then, you know, uh, the disciples decided to send Paul. So after encouraging uh, them, Paul, you know, said goodbye to them and set off to Macedonia. Okay. So we'll read what happens uh, from then. Uh, can somebody please read Acts chapter 20, verses 2 to 38? And we will see um, what happens there. He traveled through that area, speaking many words of encouragement to the people, and finally arrived in Greece, where he stayed three months. Because the Jews made a plot against him, just as he was about to sail for Syria, he decided to go back through Macedonia. He was accompanied by Sopter, son of Phyrus from Beria, Aristarus, Aristatus, and Secundus from Thessalonica. Gaius from Derby, Timothy also, and Tychius and Trompius from the Prince of Asia. These men went on ahead and waited for us at Troas. But we sailed from Philippi after the feast of unleavened bread and five days later joined the others at Troas where we stayed seven days. On the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. Paul spoke to the people and because he intended to leave the next day, kept on talking till midnight. There were many lamps in the upstairs room where he was meeting. Seated in a window was a young man named Eutychus, Eutychus, who was sinking into a deep sleep as Paul talked on and on. When he was sound asleep, he fell to the ground from the third story and was picked up dead. Paul went down, threw himself on the young man and put his arms around him. Don't be alarmed, he said. He's alive. Then he went upstairs again and broke bread and ate. After talking until daylight, he left. The people took the young man home alive and were greatly comforted. We went on ahead to the ship and sailed for Assos, where we were going to take Paul abroad. He ab aboard. He had made this arrangement because he was going there on foot. When he met us at Assos, we took him abroad, aboard and went on to Mytilene. The next day, we set sail from there and arrived off Chios. The day after that, we crossed over to Samos and on to the following day arrived at Miletus. Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus to avoid spending time in the province of Asia, for he was in a hurry to reach Jerusalem, if possible, by the day of Pentecost. From Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church. When they arrived, he said to them, You know how I lived the whole time I was with you. From the first day I came into the province of Asia, I served the Lord with great humility and with tears, although I was severely tested by the plots of the Jews. You know 
that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me, if only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. Now I know that none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. Therefore, I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he brought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples from them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Remember the words of the Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. When he had said this, he knelt down with all of them and prayed. They all wept as they embraced him and kissed him. What grieved them most was his statement that they would never see his face again. Then they accompanied him to the ship. Amen. Thank you. So just look at your maps there on your screen. It's there. So we see that Paul uh, goes from Ephesus. He goes all the way to Greece. He stays there for three months. Then from Greece, he goes, um, he sails, you know, um, um, uh, he, that is F Greece. And then uh, Philippi, you see Philippi on your map right over there. Then from Philippi, they go all the way to Troas. Okay, so can you see Troas, all of you following the map? Yes. Then from Troas, you see that he traveled to all those small islands. So you can just follow that black line over there, you know, all of those small, small islands. And uh, we know what happened in Troas, how he raised um, a man back from death to life. Okay. So then he travels across all of those small um, islands. And, uh, you know, um, uh, he comes to... Uh, Mil Miletus or Miletus, all those small islands which you um, see. And, uh, you know, Paul says he's, um, uh, when he comes to Miletus, that he meets the uh, elders at Ephesus. Okay. All the church, the elders of the church at Ephesus come to meet him there. And we read what Paul tells him. Okay. Tells them. He testifies about God's goodness. He's basically giving a testimony about his. Uh, a witness about how he has lived his life, okay? So that is something he's setting an example for the other leaders. He's saying, hey, I was not a burden to anybody, right? I earned and I lived my own life. I was not a burden, okay? And he says, uh, you know, um, and he says, all this time I have been um, shepherding you, but now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. So Paul is saying, hey, look at me. You know, I, I earned for myself. I lived my life. I was not dependent on anybody. And I don't have any inheritance other than the spiritual inheritance. So he's telling them, you know, look for spiritual inheritance, not earthly uh, inheritance. And he says, I've not coveted anyone's silver or gold, you know. And he says that, you know, I have worked hard, okay, um, and when he finishes, he tells them this very important um, statement. You know, he says that, you know, um, I commit you to God now. 
Okay, so that is something that is very, very important. He says, you know, I've done what I have to do, but now I'm committing you to God. So look at his, uh, you know, his pastoral heart as an apostle, as somebody who is not just uh, overseer of the believers, but also leaders. He's just committing them to the Lord. Okay, and he's saying that God will take over and will um, help you. And uh, he also talks about the hardships that he has gone through. And he tells them, you know, he might never be able to see them again. And they're deeply grieved. Okay. Then for Miletus, okay, he travels through several places. Look at all the small, 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 uh, you know, um, uh, islands that he uh, uh, travels through. Then he travels all the way to the Mediterranean Sea. If you look at the Mediterranean Sea. And then he comes to Caesarea. Okay, so Caesarea is there between uh, Samaria and Galilee, a small place there. He comes to Caesarea, and when he comes to Caesarea, he visits the home of uh, Philip the Evangelist. Okay, and also at this time, he meets a prophet called Agabus. Okay, and we'll see what Agabus uh, tells him about what is going to happen in Jerusalem. So we'll go for our break and come back. Thank you. <laughs> 